It's time for AgriChat, the official podcast of the Tales of the Agronaut blog and stalwart gaming community, where we talk about stuff and things, and the stuff about the things, and sometimes gaming. I'm Belgast, and let's start the show. Hey folks, it's that time again, time for another episode of AgriChat. This is episode 233. Tonight I'm joined by Ashgar. Should always acquaint. <laughs> Grace. <clears throat> Since be forgot. Kodra. And never. Sam. I couldn't Google fast enough. Phelan. Brought to mind. I've never understood that song. It, I, nobody I've does. I've never understood that song. So, this week we are recording our Games of the Year show because we don't have one Game of the Year. We have 19 because that's the way we roll. Um, Yeah, so if you've never set through one of these shows we each of us pick five games and then usually there's some overlap and we sort those towards the end of the show the ones that have multiple picks and the rest are kind of randomized in between so yeah let's do this thing cross code whose game is this i assume ashgar's that's correct you knew it had to be mine if it was a game nobody else had heard of (laughs) well i've heard of cross code i just didn't know anybody else had played it I've played a lot of CrossCode, actually. <laughs> I really like CrossCode. CrossCode is CrossCode has been in early access forever and actually launched this year and actually, you know, put in the rest of the game this year. It's a really fun RPG, action RPG, with a pixel art style, which I'm a sucker for, that involves lots of puzzles and really creative action and is based on an MMO. And you can tell whoever wrote it has played a lot of MMOs. It really shows through. I can't say a whole lot about the plot for, because spoiler reasons, but basically you are Lee. You have no memory. You can say two words. I am Groot. Hi, and Lee. At least at the start. I was going to say, and you slowly pick up words over time, which is fun. They do a lot with the premise. It's really interesting. And you find out that there are some deeper things going on behind this game. Although at least uh, somebody involved in writing this game watched Sword Art Online because they have the line... At least if you die here, you don't die in real life. Nice. I mean, this is definitely one of my favorite story based games this year. Is it available on Switch? No, and won't be Uh, anytime soon. How far did you get in this game? I'm curious. I got several dungeons in. Okay. I will say that one of my complaints about this game is I felt like I got to a point and then I logged back into it and was like, Oh, I don't know where I'm going, and I don't feel like this game is doing a good job of telling me where I should go. I just feel like the pacing is a strong point, except for in the very beginning. Because you do the intro, which has mostly story, you do the tutorial, which is a puzzle dungeon. After the tutorial, it looks like you end up in the Citadel. You have this town, there are a bunch of quests. You should really do most of the quests, unlike the Citadel, but the game doesn't do a great job of telling you that here's where you go to do these things, this is where you go next. Once you get over that hump, I think it does a lot better. I got to, you should go unlock your first crystal after that Citadel section. I actually thought the Citadel section was pretty good, uh, but mostly I was like, oh, I'm going to go explore this place. Um, And then I kind of got lost after (laughs) the Citadel section in the frozen wastes area. Uh, Okay. For me, the game really came together when you get to the first PvP battle. Uh, Oh, okay. Uh, did you lose that battle? Uh, I won four to five. Oh, maybe we're talking about something. Oh, the duel. Yeah, the duel is uh, best of five, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I did not win that. That was also interesting because you don't have to win that. I actually don't know if you what you get if you do win it. You get other nothing. Than you get the story. Achievement. Okay, the story changes a little bit, and you get the satisfaction of wiping the smug look off of that jerk's face. I will say it. I called it the first PvP battle for a reason. He continues to be a recurring character with no other purpose than to duel you. He's and then he gets a, other purpose, and it's kind of interesting, but, you know. He's very annoying. Sure I, is. I find the controls in this game a little bit awkward, and the game kind of lampshades that in the fact that you are playing a class in an MMO that no one else plays because it's not really good. <laughs> it's the well-balanced class, so nobody plays it. Okay, that's amusing. But, like, I feel... Were you playing with... Uh, controller or uh, mouse keyboard? Controller. Okay. I guess my frustration is, like, 
my class's mechanic is shooting these orbs, and I mostly find that I am not good at shooting those orbs. Not even a little. And even when I am shooting those orbs, they don't feel like they're doing much, so I'm mostly just playing it as a melee class. I mean, that's a perfectly serviceable way to play the class. It is, because it's well-balanced, so no one plays it. <laughs> Your rival is also a and therefore you can sort of look to the PvP battles to figure out, oh, I can link these things. Oh, I can do these things back-to-back. Because yep. other than his immunity to hit stun, he doesn't do anything that you can't do. That immunity to hit stun is real annoying, because you aren't I mean, immune yes. to hit stun. But also, you are reduced to a complete stop after you use combat art, and he is. The game is really fun. I need to play more of it. Uh, it's, it is one of many games that probably isn't on this list, because I set it down for a couple of days and came back and didn't know where I, what I was doing. Yeah, that's honestly why I've not made it through another game that is on everyone else's games of the year list but it's not on mine god of war because i got distracted and put it down and when i started back up i'm like i don't remember how to play this that's where i am with that game as well but yeah cross code probably my favorite rpg to come out this year excellent okay so next up is destiny 2 forsaken this is a game i put on the list uh because i think i'm the only one who's actually playing it I played um, a little bit of it, but I will admit that it did not make my game of the year list. So, elevator pitch. Basically, Destiny 1 uh, was fine, but when Taken King came out, like it was it was the the thing that made the game much, much better. And Forsaken is the, the Taken King moment for Destiny 2. Um, it's end game content is really fun it adds two new zones to the game both of which have a lot of interesting things going on um one you unlock early one you unlock after beating the campaign um i know a few weeks ago i complained the hell out of uh the black armory not dlc but now that i'm of sufficient light level um the forges are fun as hell like they're 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 great they're really fun um, it was just a light level issue. Um, and there's four of those and I've unlocked three of the four, but all in all, like it's, it's, I've done one of the raids. I've done a lot of the content. Um, Gambit is amazingly fun. Like Gambit alone would make the game worthwhile, which is this weird PVE VP mode, um, where you're, you're, you're killing mobs and then trying to take down a boss and, um definitely like it 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 brought me back into the fold of destiny uh because like after the curse of osiris uh, dlc i had kind of checked out of the game and i never really stopped playing it but like i wasn't really engaged um so like i did the warmind dlc and then i'd pop in probably about once a week just to piddle around but nothing was really holding me to the game uh mostly because there, there were a lot of mechanical problems that destiny 2 had that were uh like they had they had nerfed what a punch felt like and they had nerfed what grenades do they had like slowed down the regen rate of you know supers and grenades and melee and all of that stuff exotics no longer really felt worth having uh but forsaken came through and basically tweaked all of that and made it a much more enjoyable experience and i know i have talked at length about it already on the show so i think that's all i really have to say it's super good dragon quest 11 whose this game is me. this okay so. yeah it's i mean I, I i don't know what additional to say about it that i haven't already like it's it's a dragon quest game it's a very pretty gorgeous well-produced dragon quest game and if you like dragon quest games you'll enjoy this one if you don't like dragon quest games don't bother <laughs> what a uh, platform did you play it on uh ps4 okay so this is just like a quick note. If you're playing it on PC, um, it might generate some headache. Um, the game starts off with this massive unskippable cutscene, and I went through it twice and crashed out shortly afterwards. Oh dear. Making me go through it a third time before finally it allowed me to get far enough in the game to make a save file. So yeah, just... Yeah. If you're playing on a PC, um, prepare for some possible frustrations. Yeah. It, it is not the best port in the world. I've enjoyed, however, what I've played of it, though. Yeah, like, you know, 
killing slimes, hunting MacGuffins, experiencing really, really bad puns. The localization <laughs> is really, really good. Like yeah, it's, lots it's fantastic. And lots of puns. But you, you'd better be okay with puns. I'm a fan of puns. I remember this discussion the first time around and thinking, this is a game that I really would like to play except the puns. But puns are amazing. I don't know what all your problem is with them. I don't know why you kicked puns to a channel of its own, but... <laughs> that wasn't sad. even my doing. I know! I'll take wasn't full responsibility Dobbers? for it. <laughs> my thought... quality of life has improved significantly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and and let's be honest, these are some groaners too. I mean, they're <laughs> yeah. Okay, Fallout seventy six. Woo! The game we apparently like, but nobody else does. I mean, yeah. So this is one of the games I've played. Probably, it's it's the new breed of MMO. Uh, I actually feel like this allows you to play it more as an MMO than a lot do because it has a large overworld that you're all traveling with in together. Um, There was a lot of reservations about how you would play this game. Like, oh no, we're going to be aping Rust. This is going to be a game full of PvP jerks who do PvP jerk things. But mostly that hasn't materialized. And I think that's because of some really good decisions that Bethesda made with regards to how, like, the pvp options even work out um there was I'll be a honest i don't know why the game even has pvp like it's immensely unnecessary but it, you know go for it it's it's immensely unnecessary so so there's some cool things the one thing i think is interesting is one of the ways you can get pvp flagged is if you steal stuff from other players and so just beware, if you're going to go stealing stuff, you're probably going to get killed. Uh, because then everyone knows that you have a bounty on your head and will probably go out of their way to come kill you. It sets up some interesting things where you have uh, a bunch of interesting battlegrounds to fight over and uh, a lot of really valuable resource locations. And I... it sets it up so that non-consensual pvp like if you're just wandering around in the world you aren't stealing from somebody you aren't uh fighting over those pvp centers then you're going to uh be fine like if somebody decides to be a jerk and try and gank you a they're gonna have a really hard time of doing that and you're gonna be able to just sort of nope out of it like you can just like go into a menu and say, I'm ignoring this person now, and they can't do anything against you. Also of note, like, when someone has a bounty on their head, everyone in that session can see where they are at all times. It's free money. And, like, <laughs> as a result, people create a hunting party and go take them down. And, like, every time I've been in a map where somebody had a bounty, like, it was like clockwork. Within a few minutes, everyone had coalesced on the person and was taking them out. So it's real sad times for the person who got flagged. It is worth noting that you can get bounties on your head for other reasons than ganking, though, which is also interesting. Like, if you go to somebody else's location that they control and unlock their resource gatherers and steal from them, that also nets you a bounty on your head. So just watch out. Yeah, like, if you do things that could materially harm another player, or try you'll get a bounty and yep, yep. maybe you don't want to deal with that. So maybe don't do that. The other thing I want to comment about this game is something that I know Tam saw on Twitter, which is this game plays better if you approach it from a different perspective than you do other Fallout games. Other Fallout games, you are an adventurer going on an adventure and sol like solving problems and trying to make the world a better place. In Fallout 76... If you play the game like an archaeologist trying to figure out what happened to this world, it plays a lot better. And the game really encourages you to just go and try and understand the mysteries of what was the world like before the bombs dropped and like what led to all of the scenarios that are going on here. There's a lot of interesting mysteries to solve, including ones that I thought were like, oh man, they're just doing this because they're just hand-waving so that they can make a Fallout game. A great example. The 
newly renovated West Virginia post bombs is full of super mutants. And I was like, that doesn't make sense. That like, I can know my fallout lore and be like this, this is just them shoehorning in super mutants. Cause that's what makes a fallout game. But you can absolutely find out why are there super mutants in uh, West Virginia? As it that's turns not- out. And, and it's, it's really well done because as it turns out, the plot hole from the original fallout that some guy just happens to engineer this super virus in post-apocalyptic conditions giant Ooh, question mark FTV. isn't like no that virus existed before the bombs back when the facilities existed to actually come up with it and that guy came up with his whole deal with it later and it and it makes it closes a loophole and i at least i felt like it closed a loophole in previous fallout storytelling that was was a big gap there's a you also get to see like the origin story of uh the brotherhood of steel like that's really cool oh yeah i really i this did not crack my top 5 games but really only just barely and it's i want more games like this okay Next on the list, Subnautica, which officially released this year. Yeah, so, I mean, guess who picked this one? Surprise. Zero shocked. Um, And it's pretty much on the list because it actually came out this year. And so I'm allowed to put it on the list. And also because, frankly, I had a hard time coming up with five and, in fact, didn't come up with five games this year. Um, it's been a year where I haven't played a lot of games, and there haven't been a whole lot that I did play that really won me over, um, but I still played a ton of Subnautica, and it officially released, and actually has all of its content, and a story, and, um, yeah, again, I, I'm not sure what else I can say about this game that I haven't said a billion times times already but you get to swim around with weird sea creatures and explore and build cool bases and figure out the mystery of what happened to the ship and try to get off of a planet that's trying to kill you so it's good times and you haven't checked it out you should maybe do it it's currently i is it still free or did that end I think it may have ended. I'm not 100% sure. I think it was ending on the 27th, but it was yeah. free, um, the Epic Launcher, and it was definitely worth checking out for free, but it's still worth checking out, or if you catch it on a Steam sale. It's 24 bucks. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty great. Yeah. Yeah, it's well worth 24 bucks. It was... Um... It was one of the better, like, Minecrafty type games I played this year. I mean, I, I feel like the movement felt really good and fluid, and, you know, the, the crafting was just interesting enough without being completely obnoxious. Um, and, and I have this weird relationship with it because I've been playing it since it's been in early access for a really long time, so I've seen lots of different iterations of it. But um, but every time I restart the game, I'm still constantly like building a cool new underwater base. The only thing that I wish I could do with this game is basically like merge its underwater with everything else from No Man's Sky, and basically like create a, a hybrid experience of those two games. I was actually going to say a very similar thing with Fallout seventy six, where I really like I really like this incorporating crafting into survival kind of conceit because it makes crafting it makes crafting like the random little things that you craft all the time in these games actually feel meaningful and not like i'm working my way up a parts tree to try to build the thing i want i mean and i've i've played a couple of games of subnautica with the survival stuff turned off and like it's sort of fun but actually for me, it's more fun when I'm making that stuff for a reason. Yeah, I, I like I like crafting as less of a, oh, I need to, you know, I'm trying to make the next cool piece of armor and more like, this helps sustain me. And this like, 
this can help sustain me in ways that are better than just like foraging would. I really the biggest it. takeaway from this game is like it made me realize how terrified I am of the deep. <laughs> I mean, there's horrifying things down there. Yes, there are. True story. I mean, I talked I about this when we, when we played like the, the the game originally, but like there were so many times where like I would hear a noise in the water and then swim back up in my pod because I was afraid of the noise. So you're saying don't play it. You would not be into this game in VR. No, very much no. Like, I do not think I could play it in VR. I would really love to if I didn't think it would make me ill. Like, I would love to see what this game was like in VR. Okay, next up is not a video game. Gloomhaven. That one's mine. Um, so we play board games every week, and I th- as I think I've established, I don't like competition. And I so I've been really enjoying, and I really like cooperative RPGs. And, like cooperative rpgs that you can play together in a group have been in kind of short supply lately uh like it used to be the purview of mmos and now that those aren't really a thing anymore or at least not in the same form it's been hard to find like i want to sit down with my friends and do stuff um and a lot of the co-op rpg style um board games tend to have this they have a couple of problems where it's there's not enough to stop one player from just like dictating how the game should go so you just sort of have like the the one the one player who's like this is this is what everyone should do everyone do that thing um gloomhaven builds up a bunch of hidden information sort of hidden information um from your other cooperative players that are things that you should do and want to do but there's it's not quite co-oppetitive although it kind of is in some places like collecting money but it's also it's also not comp- actually openly competitive so you're kind of working together and trying to you know finish basically mini dungeons that all have a story attached to them and the thing that for me really makes it stand out is it's learned a bunch of lessons from games like pandemic legacy where the act of playing the game changes the game so you get stickers that you put on cards or on the board and you know things that you permanently mark on various parts of the various parts of the game like the actual game board materials and like cards that you're told to resolve and then destroy and so and there's full like story branches that you probably don't see because if you're if you go a particular direction those are closed off to you. And I think it's really, I I really love that, that that the game has a life of its own beyond just what you can play in the board game. It's the choices you make in the board game and the things that you do affect everyone who plays on that copy of the board game and in, in largely good, compelling ways. And I think that's, I think it's also, I think it's really cool. And there's a ton of like, there's a ton of hidden stuff to unlock. And I'm interested in unlocking it. Um, I think my only my only complaint with it is that the rate of unlocks could be faster. But I also understand that the audience there's a balance to be struck between you know we play this maybe twice a month tops versus there's there's people who are going to be playing it multiple times a week. And if at the point where you're playing it multiple times a week, like you don't you don't want people to exhaust all of the content immediately um so the mmo problem <laughs> yeah i mean the mmo problem the D problem where if you look at you know how long does it take to resolve an encounter in D and how much X- xp are you technically supposed to get for that encounter etc all the way up the chain it's like oh you know you're going to be at this level with the same abilities and largely the same equipment for literally months of play depending on how frequently you're playing and so on you can you know edit that but yeah that's about the only complaint that I have is it's I think it's the pace of unlocks is tuned to for a group that is playing at a more hardcore level than we do. But it's a relatively minor complaint for a game that I really, really enjoy. Yeah, and I, think I, is, I, I was going to say, I really enjoy this game as well. Um, and I especially enjoy the the various like ways you are working together and sort of some of the the ways you're trying to guess, hey, how do we solve the puzzle that is 
presented directly in front of us. It's a really cool puzzle every time we play. And and there is a limit to how much you can share information wise. So you have to sort of just trust each other and sort of get to know how each other's characters play to kind of guess what they're going to do. Yeah. And sometimes sometimes you have a turn where somebody does something that's like slightly unexpected or and it sort of throws off whole plans and then you scramble to put it back together. So there's that like level of uncertainty that keeps it interesting. It's not like, oh, hey, no, now we're now we're just a consistently well-oiled machine and we just do the, we just do our thing and win every time. The way I've seen I've definitely seen some of these other RPG style games do like uh, I think Descent has this problem where like if you know your character and everybody else knows their character, you just you, everybody does the thing and you win or don't. But there's not a lot of deviation. The way you uh, upgrade character skills permanently is also really cool. So like you're you're upgrading stuff for yourself uh, by like altering the way abilities work. But ultimately that's making a decision for anyone who plays that class in the future yeah oh that's the i mean that's the other thing is the game it doesn't have permadeath in the sense that it has like the opposite of permadeath you can you succeed and you're you you succeed at your like personal quest and your character is done your character retires from adventuring because they've accomplished the thing they've set out to do and you roll a new character and the progress that you've made means that your new character gets a bunch of boosts which is great like you get all these boosts to start at the same kind of relative power level as the rest of your party, and then you you do stuff. You can jump right back into it with a new character and learn new abilities, and it encourages you to sort of jump between and see all of the like twenty character classes there are, especially as you unlock new ones. It is a game I've had a ton of fun playing this year, and have been playing I think the most consistently of any game this year, and still look forward to playing a whole lot more of because there's still a whole lot more going on that i'm interested in seeing well i've heard good stuff from pretty much everybody that i know that plays it so i I think it's definitely a winner there okay the next game on the list is heroes of hammer watch this one is also me um and this this one is a result of me trying to figure out any games to put on my list this year and realizing that hey we play this for a game of the month and i think i maybe enjoyed it more than anybody else did i played a ridiculous number of hours of it um and it made me realize that i like broke light it was a lot of fun um because i i played some other ones and the the death thing is not always like the the way that you recover from death, what you get to take with you, how you power yourself up is not always consistent or satisfying in these kinds of games. And I felt like it it was pretty satisfying in Heroes of Hammerwatch. Um, and it was a lot of fun to play with friends, and it was still pretty fun to play solo. It, I think it was my pick, and... Like, I picked it largely because I really liked Hammerwatch, and Hammerwatch was more of a straight gauntlet game, and for whatever reason, the roguelite functionality turned me off where I was kind of expecting it to be, like, another fun gauntlet romp, but I am super glad that you liked it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I got far enough to see, I guess, like, the dragon boss at the end. I'm not sure I ever actually killed it. I know that there's umpteen billion levels of new game plus to be had um that i i sort of ran out of steam before i got to that point but um but it was just fun and it made me actually realize that oh i okay i can like these kind of games if i feel like i'm actually still moving the bar forward with each life in a satisfying way yeah yeah, that's definitely a big difference between uh, me and roguelike likes and me and roguelites is the fact that if I die, but I can be like, okay, like, it's not just I need to get good, here's something that I can make my life a little bit easier, that mm-hmm. gives me more motivation to go back into the breach. Yeah, definitely. We sort of discussed on the show about this. I'm definitely the other way around. I like knowing that 
theoretically, if I know enough, I can just beat this game with what I have from the starting point. I don't need to dive. Sadly, the game I'm talking about here missed my list slightly. I really enjoyed this one too. I don't think I got it. I definitely didn't get as far as you did. I think I only got to like the second or third boss, but it was a really cool game. It also felt a lot better to not be playing a ranger in this one. Because I definitely felt like with the original Hammer Watch, the only character I had any sort of fun with was the Ranger. Whereas I, I felt... my... Go ahead. I think my problem is, like, I mostly play the Paladin, and I could survive effectively forever as a Paladin, but it wasn't terribly fun to play, because it was, like, really slow and tedious. In melee stuff in games in general is not my jam, but in this game in particular, the melee stuff felt extra unfun. The blasting people with tons of tiny ice balls was super satisfying. Yeah, melee for me was a lot of baiting, like, a, a group of mobs to, to split so that I could get, like, three or four of them to follow me around the corner, and then I would dispatch them and then move ahead and then bait some more mobs. And But, like, for me, if melee is unfun, then the game itself is unfun. So the next one on the list is one of those out-of-time games. Thalen, Stormblood. I assume it's you. <laughs> yes, it's me. It's I, I put it on the list because for me, it is a game of 2018 because I didn't start playing it until it's true. Uh, about a month and a half ago. And it's pretty much the main thing I've been playing since then, apart from, you know, one evening spent playing a game that's also on this list. <laughs> but, you know, it's Final Fantasy XIV. It's, it's really great. And so far, like, I'm still not through even the original main story quest for Stormblood. Um, but so far, it's really interesting. I like the new characters. Gosetsu's great. Also, bards are no longer bro mages. Bards are, yes. I'm, I'm enjoying bard more than I did, I think, the entirety of Heavensward. Because it, it feels right again. Your, your yeah. years-long burnout has... Uh... <laughs> is, is over, yes. It's exciting. There's just there's, there's so much for me to do. I mean, a lot of it is stuff that I still had to do back in Heavensward, like, you know, working up crafting jobs and things like that. I, I did finally get them all up to 60 or higher, so I can actually craft things useful to Stormblood. But yeah, it turns out I still really like Final Fantasy fourteen. Who would have guessed? I think that's awesome. Like, I am still trying to get fully hooked back in, and I think mostly if I ever get over my... Uh hurdle of not tanking dungeons then i will be fine hey, if you want to take a dun I, tank a dungeon I, I need to run a dungeon <laughs> okay i'm at one of those again okay <laughs> okay so next on the list xenoblade chronicles 2 yeah this didn't come out let this didn't come out this year either this came out in december of 2017 in 2017 i had entirely too many games in it <laughs> it's true i never played the original xenoblade chronicles which released on the wii and I never bought it on the Wii. Then it released again on the 3DS, and I didn't play it there either. Because at that point, it was not exactly the prettiest game in the world. And Zelda Blade Chronicles X had come out, and I liked it much, much better. But 2 is sort of more of a open-world-ish, but still linear story-based action JRPG for the Switch. It involves Rex and Pyra as they go on to discover Elysium and the, climb the world tree and save the world, because of course that's what they do, and of course that's not actually what they do, because this has Zeno in the name. So, you know, eventually things get weird. I, I feel like there's a lot of games you like, Ash, that have the subplot of eventually things get weird. <laughs> Look, yeah. I was groomed on Final Fantasies, so... <laughs> for, for someone who dislikes time travel as much as you claim to, you do play a lot of games that involve time travel. This is not one of them? No, I thought it was. No. Huh. The... I really want to play this game um, because it looks Same. really freaking cool. It's a good game. Warning for uh, playing it, though, it runs really badly in handheld mode. Ah, uh, okay. Oh. Still, like, frame rate's mostly okay, but the resolution goes completely... It's real bad. Things things go from looking to be one of... Ah. Things go from looking like one of the prettiest games on the Switch to a game that maybe is trying to run on a toaster. So it's, it drops down to like 600p-ish. Yeah, probably worse than that. Ugh, okay. Sadness. I don't understand why that would be true. 
Like, yeah, that's I don't understand that either because, like, in theory, dot the mode hardware. shouldn't be changing anything at all. Yeah, like it's just giving it a constant power outlet. That's significant. I mean, but I could just play it in handheld mode plugged in, which is what I mostly do. I don't know. Games in handheld mode are, they tend to run with significantly lower power uh, requirements. Yeah. I know Breath of the Wild had this issue too. Yeah, because it like runs 900p or so docked and, and like 680p or so handheld. But unless it's real bad, you don't notice it because the handheld screen is only 720p anyway. Right, right. Like, so it's it's not the biggest screen in the world, so it feels okay. But yeah, this has an interesting cast of characters that get introduced to you in sometimes odd ways. The main character is unfortunately a traditional JRPG main character in that he's mostly clueless and wants to be helpful and messes things up by wanting to be helpful. So that's a bit of a letdown. But everyone around, around him is much better. JRP characters are literally the worst, except for their friends. I mean, Radiant Historia also came out this year, but that's a completely different topic. We'll save that one for the honorable mentions list. So, also in the Switch category, this one's a game that runs amazingly well in handheld mode. Diablo 3. So it turns out, it turns out... Diablo 3 and Diablo are probably actually really good games saddled with a control scheme that I find incredibly objectionable. Yeah. I uh yeah, I picked this game up and it was transformative and brought it over to Kodra and was like, Kodra, I know what you're thinking, but you got to try this. And I did, and I was like, "Oh, is is this why Bell and Grace enjoy this game because like they can in, they can enjoy the control scheme and still like get the ins and outs of this very cool intricate combat that's constantly going on without losing track of where their characters are or what buttons they should be pressing like my experience with diablo on pc is i am playing this game and like i am mashing buttons and hoping that gets me through things rather than i am making informed decisions of what button to press and when and what that is doing to help me win this game and with yep. the switch, and hoping that you, and hoping that you don't lose your char- lose your character's location on the screen amid the billion things going on and with the switch i was able to constantly be aware of where i was i was able to see what was actively threatening me i was able to know when i was like in trouble and when i wasn't i was able to like use my escapes i was able to like everything i was able to actually play the game and the game is really really good of course it is it's diablo everyone loves diablo i didn't love diablo until i played it on the switch I really love this game. Like, this has been basically the main rotation for me on the Switch for a long while now. Um, I, so, I had played Diablo 3 on the Xbox 360, and I had played it on the PS4, and the core problem there is, at the time I played it on console, it was a greatly stripped-down version of the game I knew, and now, over time, the console versions have caught right back up, so basically adventure mode and all that stuff that didn't exist on the consoles now exists and I can enjoy myself as well as seasonal play. I almost put this on my list. Like it was so close. Same actually. Yeah. Uh, this was, this was definitely transformative for me. Like I still don't think Diablo has a great story, but now I understand why people are willing to forgive that. Wait, forgive that? No. No, I'm not forgiving what they did to the story in Diablo 3. Just <laughs> I- ignore it, or maybe overlook it. <laughs> yeah, let's go with that. Yeah. Well, and, and the truth is, like, I really don't care for click-to-move interfaces. And, like, I know Grace and I both play with W moves forward. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean... And... So, like, we, we've we worked around it. We just really liked the other parts of Diablo 3. I don't like... I don't like having to aim and move with the same single input. I like being able to run in one direction while shooting in another. And the Switch lets me do that. Or at least fakes letting me do that much more gracefully. Yeah. Because I do like twin stick shooters. So, basically, if you've ever had problem with Diablo, try it on a console. If you already like Diablo, you're probably also still going to like it on a console. The Switch version is amazing. Playing it in handheld is great. 
My favorite, my favorite Diablo three Switch story is so I hand this game to Kodra and he plays it and is and like you know impassively plays it for a few minutes and then hands it back and then like th- like a few days later is like wow that was really good. <laughs> it like planted its seed, but it had to like take some time. I mean, I'm pretty sure I, I'm pretty sure I'm just impassive when I'm playing anything for the first time because I'm like really concentrating. I was very cynical because. I have never enjoyed a uh, Diablo game. And I was, so I was pretty cynical about what I was playing. And so I probably was like, "Mm, what is this? But then like, after, like, I basically handed it back to you and was like, okay, as soon as you left, I went and bought it. (laughs) Which is hilarious to me. Yeah, that was, that was the few days later. It was like, by the way, that was really good. And I bought it like immediately and I've been playing it. (laughs) Okay. So the game that probably knocked it off of my list is Magic the Gathering Arena. And the main reason why Arena is on my list is, one, I've been playing it pretty much once a week at least since it released. And I'm calling it released because I don't know what its actual state is. I'm pretty Close sure it's act- I'm pretty sure it's actually released at this point. Anyone yeah, can download so, and play it. Right. But, okay, over the years, I have played with most every digital card game. And they were all okay. But what I actually wanted was Magic the Gathering in a digital form that's not Magic Online. Because Magic Online is terrible. Because Magic Online is like the IRC chat client of Magic games. In fact, I think Apprentice is a better client than Magic Online. No. Um, so, yeah, like it's, it is not a great experience. The fact that you have to talk to chat bots to get cards is not a great experience. Um, but essentially like this was what I always wanted. Like this is exactly what I always wanted in a magic online experience. And especially now that they've added the ability for you like to actually play against people, you know, it's way better. Um, you can do drafts, you can do, uh, like right now there's a free popper event that's going on. That's really fun. Um, I don't know. Like it's, it is basically magic for me now. Uh, the only thing that would improve it is if they added more, more legacy card sets to basically add additional game modes. Um, I would love to see commander in this format. That's what, that would take a lot of work. That it would take would... a lot of work. Yeah. I mean, but there are so many quality of life improvements to this game over magic online and it's just phenomenal playing like this is this is what i've always wanted and the fact that i can draft for like three or four dollars as opposed yeah. to magic online where i actually had to be like all right let's fork out 14 dollars because these packs are just as good as paper right like it was magic online was not recognizing the realities of the digital card game environment well and so the the other side of this too is that I'm getting to open enough packs from just doing the daily quests, which are largely like cast X number of a color spells or play a game. Um, You end up with quite a bit of gold and you can buy packs. And then with the packs, you end up getting proxies and the proxies you can turn in for any card of that rarity. So for the most part, whenever I have decided I want to build a deck, I have had a backlog of proxies that I could just pick up the cards that I was missing. And also drafting is like an amazing way to pick up cards. And pretty much every weekend they're drafting a set uh, that's in the rotation. So basically, if you if you were ever a Magic the Gathering player, you should check out Arena. Because it adds the Hearthstone quality of life fixes to Magic the Gathering. And um, the other really cool thing is they're starting to add codes into like Planeswalker decks that give you that deck in game for purchasing the physical deck. So I hope they do more of that stuff in the future. Previous experiment with uh, making a fancy client, Magic Duels also did that, didn't it? I don't remember, but I know with the Guilds of Ravnica Planeswalker decks, you get like a code that basically gives you each of the decks. Not that the Planeswalker decks are that amazing, but like... You get a pelt, uh, hunter or whatever that's called, pelt collector, out of the uh, <laughs> Golgari deck. And pelt collector is an amazing card. Okay. Another game that almost made my list, even though I don't think it came out this year, Night in the Woods. Whose was this? This was mine. Oh, man. I, I told you this game was good last year. 
Yeah, K -K so... combo breaker. I <laughs> I assumed this was Grace's. I, I was this on my list. You last had this year? on your list last year. Yeah, this was on my list for last year. I mean, I could pick it again this year because I had a free space. But um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, my joke before this was that I'm looking forward to seeing what Ash's uh, list for this year was, because that's going to be my list for next year. Spoilers <laughs> for what's coming out later. But no, this game uh, was... I played this game this year, and this is the game that probably made me, like, resonated with me. Like, it's, it's the game that I go back to for sort of understanding certain things because i have both experienced uh a lot of this stuff and then a lot of it is foreign to me because i i've been ex i've been divorced from these like small town spaces for long enough that i haven't really considered what those things look like now as things keep getting worse um i love every single character in here like they are all interesting there's a lot of stuff to think about this game has made me think about how i perceive the world and just trying to be a more a more thoughtful person like i i want to i want to take away the the fact that i don't have these experiences i don't have these perceptions i got to view it this is this is a game that got me thinking more than any other game this year i love it so much and a game i've argued about more this year and tried to frame stuff around this year it's it's just really really good telling a story and creating this world that is both familiar and alien to me i i think the most interesting thing about this game is i think it resonated with all of us that it resonated with for slightly different reasons so, like, it has a lot of things going on, and there's a lot of different experiences to be had with this game. I mean, for me, it definitely resonated because I came from a town like that. Like, that might as well have been my town. Sure, there wasn't a creepy tram-turned-floatway in the middle of our town, but, like, all the rest of the trappings were pretty much there, too. But that is the sort of, like, just weird, incongruous thing that small towns do have like yeah. not that specifically but like you'll, you'll go to a small town and there's and there'll be something you're like why what how, why is this here how why was that ever here yeah you know, like who and it's just that's it's there because it's always been there and well why and, wouldn't it's, it be there? and it's usually a remnant of mm -hmm. the the heyday of that town yeah because like, once that town wasn't such a small town well like so the town i grew up in which was a town of 2,000 people. It supposedly at one point had four movie theaters and like an opera house. I'm like, I don't, See, I don't believe this house. at all. Yeah, yeah, like an opera house, like that that played light opera, and like I don't understand. Like I don't know where any of this existed. Like I only hear about this in legends, and and it's just like it's. It's it's living in a town that's well past its heyday. And like the other aspects of this game were so close to me too. Like I was I, I know I talked about this when we actually talked about the game, but like I was one of the few people that lasted more than a semester in college. Like almost everyone else I went to school with was back home by Christmas break and stayed there. So like I was I was that person that was coming home to visit and in that awkward space of like how do I interact with these people that like six months ago would have been classmates, but now I'm in a different space in my life. So I don't know. Like it, it's a really interesting game. Okay. Next on the list is I'm pretty certain whose this is. Surprise. Super Smash Brothers Ultimate. Ash. It's a new Smash Brothers. Next game. I'm <laughs> kidding. Um, <laughs> no, it's Super Smash Brothers Ultimate is, it is a new Smash Brothers for the Switch. So some automatic points there. It is, does, it introduces, it brings back every single character that's been in Smash Brothers before. It adds a few new ones like uh, Simon Belmont, Ridley, <laughs> Isabel, Incineroar for some reason. Look, I don't know why he's there either. And 
they tweaked things very slightly so that it just feels it's just fun to play. There's also a more uh, dedicated single player mode than Smash Brothers 4 had. The classic modes are more varied than Smash Brothers 4 had. It's lacking some of the other things like the weird Smash Run thing that was or Smash Run was actually pretty fun. But Smash Tour? There was some weird Smash Brothers board game in Smash Brothers 4 and it was bad. But yeah, it's just I, managed to be a fun multiplayer game with everything that the old ones had somehow. I am mostly playing World of Light as the way I am playing Smash Brothers. <laughs> and that's interesting. I really like World of Light so far. Except for one particular battle, which is complete bullshit. The Pauline spirit fight is just garbage. And I hate it. And maybe eventually I'll beat it and it'll become less garbage. But I suspect it's not going to become less garbage even after I beat it. So, honestly, like, I've not played much Smash, ever. I was not. I somehow missed the GameCube era. I missed when it was on 64. Um, so, I've played a little bit of, of the Wii U version of this game. And I've played the Switch version. And mostly the only issue that I have is I, I do not like the way jumping feels in this game. <laughs> I, I feel like it is it is way more loosey-goosey than I'm used to in a fighting game. I tend to turn off, press up to jump. Okay, what button do you use to jump then? X. Okay, well then, then holy hell, I need to do this thing, because like, that would make it feel immediately much better. This makes a lot more sense if you're playing on a GameCube controller, which Ash always will be playing on. Mostly, but even... Even without playing on a GameCube controller, it makes more sense than pressing up to jump, at least to me. Well, like, so in a fighting game, I'm used to the the jumping of, like, Mortal Kombat Street Fighter 2, where it doesn't feel as floaty. And, yeah, no, like, the it feels like I have to, like, slam the joystick upwards to get a jump to happen. Those games also have uh, Castlevania-style jumps. Yes, they do. Once you once you once you leave the ground, your arc is set. Yeah. And Smash Brothers has a lot of air control, which feels really weird to me. But like for the purpose of World of Light, it's fine. But I do not think I would do well against other human beings. You might be surprised. I was really surprised <laughs> at how much I've been enjoying playing this game. I got beat by one of my little cousins over the holidays, so that was also a thing. We haven't gone back and played now that it's been out. I suspect that Ash would mop the floor, floor with us, I, but I, it was a lot of fun. Probably not. We had like we had like four of us just going nuts. I I still have the problem with this game where I lose my character in the chaos and die, and it's not a good feeling. But otherwise, yeah. I really enjoy it. I don't know if there's some way to like tone down the aggressive special effects so that I can like actually follow my character around. But I will say that this one turned up the smoke trail effect when you get hit, and that feels like it contributes to that significantly. Contributes to me not being able to see where I am? Yeah. 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 That's definitely accurate. All I know right now is Marth is my jam. <laughs> I, I am all about the Falcon. I have Simon now, and I think Simon is great. Cloud I mean, or Zelda. Falcon's okay, but it would be better if Samurai Goro was the character. Just saying. <laughs> Because Samurai Goro is clearly the best F-Zero character. Yes. I feel like Samurai Goro only gets credit for being the only character F-Zero character people know of that isn't Captain Falcon. No, no, no. I feel like doing the Palpatine. No! Samurai Goro was the best character. Like, it was the racer I always picked. Because the Stingray was amazing. Mm -mm. But anyway, <laughs> that's not consequential to Smash Brothers. Also, Nintendo, I would really like another F-Zero game. Yeah, but only like three people bought the last one, so sorry. <sighs> Look, it doesn't matter. So, okay. Okay, now, now that we're going to do some chicanery here, um, Tam, Hitman 2. <laughs> uh, I might do this in two parts. I don't know. So, I mean, haha, it's a great surprise that I like a stealth game. What a shocker. Um <laughs> In this case, it's actually somewhat surprising because the last, like, three Hitman games have been kind of shooting, not 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 actually good for a variety of reasons. And so I've kind of been out of the hit. I've, like, talked about how I like the Hitman franchise, but, like, I like the Hitman. Hitman has always been the stealth game series that I have liked despite everything. Because 
they've had interesting stuff going on, but really janky controls, and they feel awkward to play a lot of the time. And, like, there's a lot of miss in the hit or miss going on. Like, some levels are, like, are great and satisfying, and some levels are just incredibly hot garbage and not fun. And so, like, it makes it into my Stealth Games Tam Likes wheelhouse, but, like... It wasn't really invited to the party. It's just there. <laughs> um, just showed up. It's hanging out by the dip. Everybody has to interact with them if they want to dip their chips. Right. And this took a real dive right around Hitman Absolution. Because Hitman, for me, there's there's a couple of things going on with it. Um, the original Hitman was a disaster. Like, I couldn't even force my, myself to play through that game. Much like the first Assassin's Creed. Similarly, a disaster. Um but in, but a compelling one. Um, minus, and then over the course of Silent Assassin and Blood Money and Contracts, and I forget the exact order those come in, they really sort of hit their stride in how to build levels, how to make interesting things happen. They really sort of hit the, they really sort of lean a little bit into this game is kind of absurd, but also they lean into the meta story where there's this really interesting meta arc going on but you mostly don't get to see it it's it all happens in cutscenes between levels or in your like voiceover mission briefings and they're they were always packed with character or like interesting tidbits but they were never really put together cohesively but it also meant that the missions all had a kind because there was no like internal mission communication going on the missions all had there there weren't any twists well, there were very rarely twists in missions. If there was a twist in a mission, it's because you weren't paying close enough attention. And um, and this all sort of culminates in Absolution, which was the the first game, um, the first game that was I think I think it was the first one that's that Square Enix developed. But it was a game that said, "Hey, you know what's cool about Hitman? His like ridiculous twin pistols." That's I mean... the, and and they're not wrong. Those were really cool. You just never used them. Yeah. And they were, <laughs> and and it absolutely a flaw with the previous games was, hey, they give you this, they give you this item that you start every level with, and it's just a liability because if you get frisked, they're a problem. So like, it's like the first thing you do in every level is look for a trash can to, to put your, you know, silver pistols into just so that they don't cause a problem for you later. Um, and Absolution was like, let's not do that. Let's make all of these levels like super linear. We're going to tell a really like tight, cohesive story that's very linear and involves a lot of like, oh, things go wrong and now you've got to go loud in a scripted way. And it's just, it was terrible. Like it's not, it was uh, not a good action game. So I went into the Hitman that released in 2016 kind of skeptically and i was like oh this is good but oh it's episodic and i lost interest immediately flash forward to this year people are saying that hitman 2 is really good okay i mean the last one was promising but let's see if this one's any good so this one has a bunch of improvements over the interface uh and so it actually plays it, it plays really quite well you've got a lot of control over what you can do there's a lot of buttons because there's a lot of types of interactions you can do but they're also very clearly labeled, so you know which button you need to press to get anything to happen. They don't have they don't have the weird um, like select from this pop up menu what thing you want to do, where you might accidentally like choke somebody out instead of having a chat with them, which was <laughs> which was always a problem. Like, oh, whoops, you held this person up instead of handing them some flowers. Uh, now those that's are, all. Those are totally equivalent. Just saying. The, yeah, and they had an interact. They had like a context, contextual interactions menu, and like it was not a good situation. So that's all. That's all very much improved. But I think the thing that improves it the most is Diana, your handler, is more than a voice who shows up in cutscenes or in um, in mission briefings. She was always the most interesting character because she's the one that actually has a personality. And 47 doesn't. Like, 47 explicitly doesn't. Like, that's sort of the point. Right. And and so a lot of the, like, meta story is driven by Diana, who's really kind of the main character of the Hitman series. And in this one, she's your earpiece. And she sees what you see, she hears what you hear, and she's talking to you, like, eye-in-the-sky style, through all of the 
through all of these missions. And so you get a lot, she gets a lot more screen time. She's a lot more interesting. Like she, she manages to hit that like perfectly British, still kind of cracks jokes while being like turbo professional. And it also means that things can go sideways in a mission or unexpected stuff can come up and she's there to talk you through it. And it, it pairs with really good, me- like the game does a bunch of improved messaging for, hey, here's an interesting thing that you might think of, but it presents it to you in a sensible way because, oh, you overhear a conversation. Diana also hears this conversation. You can pop into a menu where she'll say, oh, hey, that was an interesting piece of information. We can do something with that. And she'll talk you through where you might, where you might go or where you might look to try to you know, take advantage of it. And it it works super, super well because it's like, okay, now there's a narrative reason for me to think, oh, I should go looking for a camera lens in this giant mission. Like, oh, if I find this camera lens, then I can go pretend to be a camera person for this reporter who's interviewing one of my targets, um, which is which is super great. It also does the thing that the original Hitman never was never very good at. It would always say, like, oh, you can go back to a mission and solve it in a bunch of different ways, but it, there was never a reason to try to do this or a, or even necessarily an, an impetus. Like, every Hitman level is this delicately multi-layer wrapped puzzle, and you're teasing out where are the weak points in this puzzle so that you can get down into the next layer and eventually work your way towards the center to your target but also try to leave yourself enough space to then get out. And so you're like unraveling these really, really intricate moving parts puzzles. And this game does a thing where you can get level XP depending on how well you do. And as you unlock, as you get higher levels, you unlock various things like, oh, here's a piece of equipment that you can start this mission with. Or here's a here's a different place you can start the mission from. And it's really it's really cool because it's like, there is a mission that takes place at a fashion show. And there's a whole section that I saw that was like the kitchens, the like catering staff for the fashion show. But I never, in my first run through, I never found a, like a good intersection point where I could like infiltrate the kitchen staff. And by the time I could, I had a better disguise and was further into the puzzle anyway. One of the things that I unlocked was... You start as an infiltrated kitchen staff in a different location, which <laughs> totally changes like all of the different pieces of the puzzle. It's like, oh, okay, so that means that I'll be in, I'll, I'll like start in this house, but also it means that the guard that I had knocked out at the very beginning is still going to be there, and so my escape route is different. So it lets you like play the same levels. It, it adds a whole bunch of replayability to these levels that existed before but wasn't well messaged. And then on top of that, they have this time-limited elusive target thing where they change every so often. You pick an elusive target, and it's the same level that you've been to before, rearranged slightly with a different target doing different things. So they get to leverage these like incredibly huge, elaborate levels where you want to try you know, to do something else. And it retains the same kind of tongue-in-cheek comedy that the series has always had. Like, it's incredibly dark comedy. But but it's, it's really funny because 47 is this huge, like, dour, muscular, creepy-looking bald guy. Seeing him dress up in, like, a clown outfit or, like, <laughs> or, like as a pool boy is just, it's hilarious and incredibly silly. Like I, I, I have I have heard one thing in this game is like seeing somebody in an interesting outfit and being like I want to see forty seven in that yeah and go knock him out I mean one of the missions he's like <laughs> super like he's like super chiseled and dour and his missions at a fashion show and there's like a high profile fashion guy who's this chiseled bald guy <laughs> and so you can totally well. just impersonate this guy because you kind of look like him. Uh, and and it it culminates into like some of my favorite stuff where one of the items that you can start with is a explosive. You you can start with like explosives or lockpicks or whatever. One of them is an explosive rubber duck, which is mostly notable because like explosives are kind of obvious. And so if somebody finds an explosive, they'll be suspicious. And so the explosive rubber duck is 
a not suspicious looking explosive. I mean, apart from the fact that you're carrying a rubber duck around for some reason. Right. You're carrying around a rubber duck, a rubber duck around for some reason. And if people find it, they'll be like, they won't, they won't call the police because there's, they don't think it's a bomb, but they'll be like, what is this rubber duck doing here? And we'll go move the, much like they'll, if they find a gun lying around that you haven't picked up or some other thing, they'll pick up that thing and move it to where it ought to be, which can be useful. You know, if you, you can be like, oh, hey, I'm going to leave a shovel out and the gardener is going to go pick it up and put it back in the shed. And you could like use that for some purpose. But they'll take the rubber duck and like return it to somebody's bathroom. Or in the case that I recently had that is probably my funniest moment, uh, I've got two targets in a mission. I figured out how I'm going to do, how I'm going to handle this first target. I'm going to put the rubber duck by the bath. And so when they go and take a bath, the, the duck will explode. Great. Fantastic. And so... I'm sitting here setting up this elaborate trap for the other person in a pool boy outfit by the pool when I get the little picture-in-picture cutaway showing me the duck exploding. The force of the blast hurls the first target out of the window, which happens to be above the pool, slams into the other target, knocking them out immediately. They both fall into the pool, and the unconscious target drowns. (laughs) And I stand there, like, halfway through setting up this Rube Goldbergian trap that I was preparing. I'm like, well, guess it's time to leave. Surely that was worth an achievement. I don't know. It probably was. Um, That's the other thing. They have really, they have achievements for all of the interesting ways you can try to take down targets. And they do a really good job of messaging, like, hey, have you, did you try this? They, They hint at, they hint at things you might try to do without telling you how to do them. And so all of these, it's like, oh, wow, that's a thing I could have done? Like, oh, I could have convinced this guy his house is haunted? What? <laughs> I I currently have too many games to play, but having watched maybe five minutes of gameplay footage of this, I am interested in it. Uh, mostly because I, in theory, would like Hitman games, but the only Hitman game I've ever actually played is Silent Assassin, which was a stealth game without any concept of messaging. Wasn't yes. that the other Hitman 2? Yes, it was yes. the other Hitman 2. <laughs> and so watching a Hitman game where there is messaging and context-sensitive maneuvers and, like, I'm not trying to, like, position myself perfectly to use my garot, uh makes me intrigued. Yeah. I also like that as a bo- because I had purchased the full original game, uh, as a bonus, when I loaded up Hitman 2, it was like, oh, by the way, we loaded all of the content from the first one into Hitman 2 so that you can just play the full story start to finish in one game with all of the like engine upgrades and little mechanics tweaks. Everything that we did for the first one, you now can just have in the second one. The proper way to do a sequel. That's pretty cool. It was really nice. By first one, do you mean the the rebooted one? The rebooted one, yes. Okay. It is also, this is, as far as I can tell, explicitly a reboot. Like, it calls, it does not, it it pretends that absolution never happened. Okay. And I think that's okay. It's probably okay. But yes, it's been consuming, like, it came out very recently, and it's been consuming a shocking amount of my time. But it is incredibly satisfying to get these levels down right. Okay, now to the game that is in part the reason why you're playing Hitman 2. <laughs> Return of the Obra Dinn. Yes. I know it was on my list, and I think it's on Phelan's list. It is. Uh, I'm going to retroactively add it as my fifth game I picked for. Hooray! I had a feeling that you would enjoy this game, Grace, for, for reasons. Uh, yeah, for reasons. I also played and beat and loved this game. It just didn't quite make my list. But Thalen, I think you were the one who introduced this to us. I did. And I mean, I don't know, I kind of feel like I've talked about it a lot, and I should let other people talk about it. But I'm I'm very glad my checking it out led to other people checking it out and also enjoying it. Like, it's it's just, it's it's a fantastic giant logic puzzle about, you know, about insurance adjustment So on, on a ship of the dead. On, well, on a, a ship, ship where of everybody the dead. Is. A, sh- a ship where where there is no longer anybody left alive for reasons yeah and so you have a stopwatch that whenever you come across human remains you can go teleport into 
a scene that depicts those human remains time of death uh and you also still get seen. still seen you get a brief uh um introduction any any words that would have been heard immediately prior to that death and then you get to see what's going on and you are trying to i like you're going to be going back and forth in these scenes as you uncover the clues that allow you to make more definitive judgments. Yeah, like there are absolutely people t- that to to identify them without like without any trial and error, you need at least three separate scenes to like put together elements from each one to determine ah that's who this person is and yeah, like and it's really important as you go to basically like log everything you learned at the moment like you may not know who people are but like at least log how the person died and otherwise if you, you'll get and if lost you to, and if you manage to determine at least what their role on the ship was like you have for for each rank aboard the ship one of the options you can set for a person is unknown whatever unknown officer unknown midshipman unknown passenger like, yeah being able to do helpful. that when i when i realized that was a thing that was a bit of a game changer so it's like yeah. i know this guy is a steward but i'm not sure who's steward yet yeah or like i know it's a topman but i don't know who i do kind of wish i could uh at some point have said unknown russian <laughs> <laughs> yeah that man that was... This That's game had me googling words to figure out what language they were in. <laughs> <laughs> the the one for me was Era Durar. Because I was like, that sounds Scottish. Is that Scottish? No, that's Swedish. <laughs> um yeah, that that was when I had to Google words. I I think the idea and then the idea is that every single scene gets written into your book. The book every little bit of that book has some sort of clue that you need to pay attention to. Yes. Even the parts that you don't necessarily think might. Yep. Hint. 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 It it uses every part of the puzzle. Yeah. And there were... So, I will cop to, there were some things that I definitely only got by guessing. One of yeah. the One of the aspects of this game is... If you ever get three entries completely correct, those entries get the game stops and says, good job, three more correct. And then it makes those entries permanently written into the book. So this is a good way of sort of trial and erroring certain things. I admit to never figuring out a good way of differentiating between uh, the like four Chinese top men. Uh, I, I will tell you later. There okay. is a way. Uh, yeah. And, like, I could figure out one based on what bunk they were in, but I couldn't figure out the other three. Uh, the the favorite thing that I, like, that the game does is the fact that, like, your guesses are handwritten in your book. What is confirmed goes into typeface. So, like, yep. as you're going back through, you can clearly differentiate between, oh, this is a page I've already solved. And more importantly, like, this is a person I have correctly identified. Right, right. yeah. This is also useful for realizing that, oh, I got something wrong about that guy, because yep. I I only just only just now did it tell me I got three right, and this person, I filled everything out. So, and it, that wasn't one of the three. So, yeah, I definitely, I, got wrong uh, I, I, I had had to use that method to figure out whether to call something an enemy or a beast. Mm. Yeah, yes. that was that was a problem I had. Yeah, there is some forgiveness on some of the some of the um, fates. Like there there are some where a couple of different things will be correct. But yes, the difference between enemy and beast is is, yeah, is it is it different. both correct if somebody either drowns or freezes? That I don't know. I know there are I... some where drowned and devoured are both acceptable. Ah. <laughs> Yeah, like I, I can think of two specific cases where that would be true. I felt so, like there I believe spiked and speared are pretty much interchangeable. So I so I bounced off really hard from this one. Um and for for a I don't know, it feels shallow, but uh but I think it's relevant because it hasn't come up in conversation yet. Um so the game has a very particular art style. And it does. it's a really interesting art style. 
but it lost me when it was like, hey, you'll notice that this thing changed. And I'm like, I don't see a difference. It's really important that you pay attention to when this thing changes. Also, this other thing, you notice how these two things are different? You can use this for clues. And I'm like, I can't see the difference between those two things. Oh. And I was like, I, I, when it says, oh, hey, you know more about this person because their face is unblurred. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Those, those two faces look the same to me. And really? Like, yeah. Oh. And so I could never tell when it thought I had enough information to start making guesses about anything. Oh. Yeah, that would be a and, problem. And so I was just, and I tried it on, I tried it on a variety of the different like visual settings. Cause like the default one gave me a really bad headache and I don't, and I think there might, I don't know if there's like bugs or what in the other ones, but like I couldn't tell. And so there's a bunch of stuff that's like, if I could tell, if I could visually parse a difference between like these two people's uniforms or these faces being blurry or not, I bet I could get into this game, but like I literally yeah. can't see it. And yeah. so like. Yeah, yeah, that's, not a faces, shallow, that's important. Yeah, that's, not no, a, that's, that's a huge problem. Well, so because there's like three distinct states that people's faces are in. There is like this person is a background character and you don't know anything. Then there's like a a blur effect where you kind of know some stuff, but like you don't know enough. And then there's like, oh, this is a sharp line art drawing. You should be able to start like solve this by now yeah that that's how the game signals you now have you now have enough information that you could guess who this per you could determine who this person is yeah there might there be might more support. information that'll make it easier to figure out but to, to give you to give you an idea to but give yeah. you an idea of how how much i was not able to like detect this core mechanic of the game i was i had already done everything in the hold and was halfway through the like going back on the top deck the second time before mm -hmm. I got my first three people. Oh wow. Oh yeah. wow. Because that's how little I could tell visually what was going on. So it's it's interesting because from my perspective, I could get the first three people based on the first only the stuff that happened in the captain's chamber. Yeah, me too. Or well only only the bodies found in yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah, I couldn't identify them visually well enough to be able to I, make calls i didn't even realize you could go past that point if you hadn't identified them yep like i can. assumed you just got stopped until you identified those first three people nope because like that's kind of the basis of everything from that point on yeah knowing who those three people are yep anyway yes i bounced but i bounced off this game unfortunately because of its art style um but i think its art style was very interesting yeah. yeah, and like it's, worth mentioning, worth mentioning because I think that's that's interesting. Like in the in the spirit of this is games of the year, not things we didn't like about games. Like I think yeah. its art style is really interesting. Yeah, it's very much intended to be the way you remember old two color games from like the eighties. Yeah, it does yes. this super good job of being like it's that it's that nostalgic without actually being the thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean it, and it. It sneaks in there because it starts out, for me at least, it started out and it felt really annoying. Like, oh my goodness, why did they do this? This is pretty silly. And then suddenly I was super into the game and I was like, yes, this feels like a game that I would have been playing in, you know, the late 80s or something. Yeah. I So one of the things that it does that I love in games is when you're given visual markers but not actually told what it means and you kind of have to extrapolate the story that's going on between the lines because mm -hmm. there's there's a lot of things that you don't really necessarily know for certain are happening but like you can kind of assume are happening so like you're using your imagination to make up the middle ground yeah which admittedly is like one of the things i love about destiny to, or destiny in general and i thought maybe that was why you bounced him Oh no, like this one told me this one told me absolutely up front that I'm gonna have to dig for clues and make leaps of logic to make sense of the story. And that that's like the core mechanic. And like I honestly like I liked everything I saw about the mechanics of that. I liked other than the bit where like once I had seen everything in a scene, I had to wait for it to decide to kick me out of the scene. 
instead that of actually a, being able to leave it. And I found yeah. that really annoying. But like, other than that, the the conceit was interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's really the only thing I can complain about is like, there were a couple cases where there's not a lot going on in this scene and I saw it already and now I'm having to wait for the timer to run out. Yeah. And conversely, every once in a while, there was one where it's like, no, I'm still looking around. And yes, you yes. can stay in the scene after the thing was, but it just, like, it it's a weird annoyance that it breaks up your concentration that way. Mm -hmm. Well, specifically, like, not to give too much detail away, but, like, that first major scene that happens on the deck. Yeah. yeah. There's so much going on that, like, I had to roam around for a while before realizing what all was happening, because, like, that that alone was going to be the clue to so many things for the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot going on that's in that scene and multiple things that you, you need to notice. Yeah. Did but everyone... Like, did did all of us who played it get the full completion of the book? Yes. I did. Yeah. I I am super thankful that the game gives you a message saying, "Look, you found everything you can. Go forward now." Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty great cuz I got nervous. You get to a point where like the the game sort of pokes you and says like, "Hey, you could leave now." Yeah. And I was like, "Do I do that? No, I like I have way too much stuff left to figure out here. Yeah, and well, I'm and if, glad and if you go and if you go to leave, the the guy does tell you, okay, we can't come back if we leave. Right. But, yeah, warning. I was a little, I was a little concerned there too. I was like, okay, should should I leave? And but, am I going to run yeah. out of time or something? Like, do yeah. I need to rush now? Well, and the main reason why I'm thankful it gave you a message saying, okay, you can leave now is because at that point, there's still several people that you don't know the fate for. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I guess two. I think there's two but... at that point, yeah. Then, and, it, and it does, like, shade the area of the little symbol that their fates lie in to kind of signal that. But yeah. But yeah, if it hadn't explicitly told me, okay, you've done everything you can here, leave now. Like, I probably would have been looking around to make sure that I hadn't missed anything. I do kind of want to go through and figure out all of the clues I missed at this point. Like, because there's a lot of stuff that... there's there, I, I will say there's one scene specifically where it says someone died in this scene, and you actually can't find them in that scene, and that was really frustrating for me. <laughs> there's a cup, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I oh. kind of want to do it a second playthrough where I go through and just, like, as someone is revealed to be identifiable to make sure that I can, like, can I identify them yeah, at that like, point? Yeah, what, what were the clues? And, yeah. But I like that it basically tells you how much of a leap of logic it's going to be to identify this person at that point. Yeah, the little the up arrows tell you or whatever. how it's going to be, yeah. I don't remember if they're up or down, but yeah, there's, like, there's markers indicating, like, how hard it's going to be for you to tell at this point. Admittedly, I'm not sure... I'm not sure how they decided what the difficulty is. Like, I think part of it's based on just how 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 actually small the clue in question is, and thus how likely you are to have noticed it. I mean, at least one of them, the difficulty. I think it said it was two arrows, but and the clue to make the determination was indeed very very small. But I also realized that I needed to look for that specific thing, so it, it wasn't hard to find. <laughs> So I don't know. I would love to talk with you guys after this about yeah. this because there's a bunch of things that like one of the one of my persistent questions that never got answered is what the heck is up with Bunk X? Yeah, I'm not too I'm not too clear on that myself. I don't know if yeah I don't know because yeah, I, I did know. find one and I don't know what it why that one was marked with an X. But yes, there's a lot of minor details that you have to pay attention to and slowly piece together a really cool puzzle. Yeah, like if if the guy just decided to keep making more games like this, I, I would probably just keep uh, buying them. Yeah, he probably I, won't because you know. I mean, he'll go do something different. It's but... probably the best twenty dollars I've spent in a while, and I mean, like it is somewhere between like five and ten hours worth of gameplay, depending on how fast you get through the puzzles. He did you ever play his previous game? Uh, Papers, please. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it kind of is. It's it's not completely unlike that. I mean, I can see. I can see. I can. I can believe that the same person made both games. Ah, yeah. Okay. But they, 
they feel like very different games to me. I think in That's part fair. because, and I think the, the the thing that I really really like about this game is there is absolutely no time crunch. You can take as long as you want to solve these puzzles, to look around at the scenes, to figure out the fates, to find the clues. There's Apart from that, you know, the first time that you look at a scene, it kicks you out after X amount of time. You can go back into that scene later and you can look at it as much as you want. And so I, I really, really like that. <laughs> that's that's part of why I really like this and why I didn't so much like Sexy Brutal as much is they're very similar games. But, like, I did not like, for lack of a better term, the Rube Goldberg aspect of Sexy Brutal, mm -hmm. where, like, you had to set up a machine... You need to be and, in this place at this time. Yeah, too. yeah, yeah. I really liked. I would have liked it if I was just figuring out who killed who. Like basically, what you're doing in this game. I don't like being on a timer functionally. Yeah, in Sexy Brutal, you were you were trying to figure out what was going to happen and then stop it from happening. Right. Here, it's simply figure out what happened. Okay, so next game up, Spider Man Two. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading literally. Two people pick Spider-Man. Aha. So Spider-Man. I'm pretty sure I know which two people. I mean, admittedly, one of them was me, so. Yeah, I figured it was Thalen, and I assume Tam? Oh, yeah. I assume okay. Tam, yeah. Like, this this game is fantastic. It's, like, I have been, I have been reading Spider-Man comics since the mid-80s, and this is like one of the best Spider-Man stories I have experienced. It's that good. I got this I... game for Christmas and I am just starting to get into it. But it this is my expect really... to see this on the list next year game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, same here. Like this game I I don't even like Spider-Man. Like I picked this game up I, I picked this game up exclusively because somebody else I know who doesn't like Spider-Man was like actually they do some cool stuff. You should check it out. And like, I kind of like Spider Man now. Like, I kind of want to go see into the, into the Spider Verse. Because mm -hmm. I absolutely didn't like Spider Man prior to playing this game, and now I do. Like, I see why people are into Spider Man. He's, he's yeah, he's a fantastic character. P.S. Into the Spider Verse is amazing. Go see it. I need to find somebody to go see it with. But yes, it's on the list. So one of the coolest videos you can see. Um, I don't even know where I came across it, but basically, like. I Spider Man on the Dreamcast, especially Spider Man Two, was amazing because of the web sling. <laughs> and there's a video of a guy who like basically takes his PlayStation Four to the guy that designed the web sling from Spider Man on the Dreamcast and like has him play it and like he's commenting on like all the things that they borrowed from him and like all the things that they improved that he never could have done. It is a really interesting video to watch. Yeah, the, the, the move around of that game fantastic. is just fun. Yeah, it's yeah, its movement is so fun. Like I like the movement more than the combat. The combat is fine, <laughs> but but the movement is so good that I'm I'm here for it. Um, the other thing, the other thing that stands out and wins a million points for me is oh hey, this game it's an open world game. You know what open world games have? Go collect a bunch of stuff. You know what this game manages to make interesting? collecting a bunch of stuff yes chasing pigeons yeah like every there's a there's a ton of random little collectibles and every collectible gives me a little bit of content it's not like oh you've collected one out of 700 feathers good job maybe something will happen if you collect all 700 but probably you'll just get a little achievement pop up but like wandering around finding backpacks and they're all like weird stashes from when you know, Spider-Man was just hiding stuff around, and it's all, like, weird, weird little personal stuff or, like, weird little uh, tidbits. You'll just get little little story tidbits. Yeah, I love all the, the backpack stuff. It's great. I, it does It does the raise the question. Spider-Man's webbing dissolves after about an hour, and some of those backpacks have supposedly been there for years, so... Hmm? Maybe he has but whatever. perma webbing. Details. I mean, it's the special webbing specifically intended for that purpose. Sure. He he no must stuff. buy a lot of backpacks. Yes, that's he's in character. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, it does. Yeah. This is also it's also my favorite uh, Mary Jane portrayal. Like, yeah. I love like, every I love every scene that's the two of them where it's like Peter Parker being dumb and Mary Jane being like, right, 
this is why I broke up with you. I, I would love to see this take on Mary Jane, like, merged into the mainline comics Mary Jane. Like, that, I think this is the the most I've liked her as her own character. Yeah, she's like, oh, I'm about as, I'm about as confident as Spider-Man without actually having any superpowers. Because Peter Parker is dumb. And, like... The game really leans into that. He's not dumb. He just makes poor choices sometimes. He's not good with women or no, just no, interpersonal not. relationships in general. Okay. The next game, I believe, is a repeat from last year. Hollow Knight. It might be my repeat from last year. It's bad. <laughs> because I played this game more this year than I did last year. Ash is single-handedly trying to... Uh, Make up for all the times Hollow Knight has been robbed in other awards shows. This is came on my ta- list last year because it should have been. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Kotaku named it their game of 2018 as well. Did they? Or at least Jason Schreier did. <laughs> Listen, this game is amazing. I didn't get to play it last year, so yes, I'm going to talk about it this year. I think this is the game I played the most in 2018. Uh... Turns out there's a best Metroidvania, and it's this. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry I for feel everyone. Like everyone who loves Super Metroid and or Symphony of the Night just got mad at you for some reason. <laughs> they can get mad at me all they want. I mean, I love Symphony of the Night so much. So, so much. I contributed to the Kickstarter for the new game by that guy because I love Symphony of the Night so much. Hollow Knight is the best Metroidvania. I need to spend more time with this game because, like, I have... I have not gotten into it the way I expected to, but it's mostly that I haven't played it enough to get past the initial, I don't know where the hell I'm going. I've sunk so many hours into this game, and I have still not gotten any ending, and I'm, like, not even mad anymore. I still love this game. I am, I am like, legitimately curious from somebody who would know better. Are most Metroidvania combat systems as deep as the one that i get in hollow knight and i just they're locked off no okay no oh my goodness is the combat experience so deep and so much fun like there's so much for me to do in here so many different ways for me to fight like my my charms feel like throwaways in other games but they are game defining in this Mm -hmm. most metroidvanias have one of two scenarios that they're working on either it is a mega man-esque use this weapon to unlock this battle yeah or this is just infinitely better than the thing you had before so you're going to use it now the castlevania model yep Yep. i will be honest i'm not good enough at this game to use sword arts but i've seen people who use those effectively (laughs) there's only one i could use is the great slash i hear that it, once you're good, using the, the spinning one is, is pretty amazing as well. I mean, that's the most damage you can do in a short period of time, is to leave the spinning nail art, but I can't, not that good. This game has boss fights that make me feel like I'm in a raid. Uh, like, and, and admittedly, this is, this is gonna be a, a thing that turns a lot of people off, but the fact that I could spend, like, two hours grinding my face on Nightmare King Grin... And, like, the fact that I know there are still fights out there that are just like, no, you, you don't do these fights, uh, Kodra. These are, these these you need to be better at this game to even start bothering with. And I, and I think that's honestly, like, what has led me to bounce off of this game is I'm not really big into punishing games. And I mostly liked Metroidvanias for the exploration aspect. The thing is, the boss rush stuff is hidden away in a section of the game, which you have to kind of go out of your way to even run into now. Yeah, it's incredibly optional. Well, but like any of the bosses are way more challenging than Metroid and Castlevania bosses yes. were. Yeah, they're definitely yeah. rough. But I like I did. I mean, I, I'm really terrible at these kinds of games in this particular style of combat, and I still managed to mostly like beat my face against things until I could get through it, until I hit a wall named Time Knight. There are a few, yeah, that's that's one of them. There are a few bosses that are uh, maybe a little harder than their placement would indicate. My my wall in that game is, I don't know where to go next, and the map isn't helpful. 
I feel like one day I'm going to pick it back up and, you know, have some epiphany as to where I'm supposed to go next, but, or where I even can go next, but it hasn't happened. So, but otherwise I love, I don't even like Metroidvanias for the most part, but I like this one. This has caused every Metroidvania that came out this year to come up short. It's probably going to do that for a few years. Yeah, seems likely. This is the game that I'm most interested in randomizers for because that (laughs) extends the content for me. Uh, This is Team Cherry's first game, right? Yes. I mean, there was Hungry Night, but we don't talk about Hungry Night. (laughs) I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, this is the type of thing that makes, like, it's not as revolutionary, but I'm still almost as impressed as this as I was with, like, the dev story of Mario 64. Because I don't know how these relative newcomers managed to make a product so perfect that other people have been, like, trying to make for the past 20 years. I mean, there are a lot of indie Metroidvanias. A yeah. lot of indie Metroidvanias. Is is this a, a thousand monkeys with typewriters given infinite amount of time scenario? I mean, maybe, but... To a degree, but I don't know. I feel like they studied, they studied what works, what didn't, and they made their game. Yeah, that's fair. I don't. I, it doesn't quite hit Mario sixty four for me because there's nothing going on that I'm like. I don't understand how this was even technically possible. <laughs> no, I don't. Doesn't do anything technically revolutionary. And as far as design goes, it's way more nonlinear than most Metroidvanias. But other than that, it's not exactly revolutionary. It's just incredibly well executed. It is extremely well executed. Very polished. Honestly, like, for me, Hollow Knight is a mix of Castlevania Symphony of the Night and Shovel Knight. (laughs) Like, those are the two games, to me, that, like, if you somehow mash them together, you end up with Hollow Knight. Because combat is a lot more like Shovel Knight, to me at least. And the exploration is like Symphony of the Night, minus the fact that Symphony of the Night was way more constrained to a, a linear path. Like, there were, there were definitely places you could not go at the beginning. And it doesn't feel like you're quite as constrained with Hollow Knight. You can kind of go off in weird directions and it will totally let you. I mean, at the beginning, fairly, you are with, fairly tightly constrained to the Forgotten Crossroads. Yeah. So you get the fireball. Once you get the toilet. fireball, which you can do by beating the first boss or not. Well, one of the first <laughs> bosses or not. The uh, you can go into Green Path, which gets you the dash. And once you have the dash, you have more options. And then tip there's also the incredibly nonlinear option you can do, which is farm Geo and the Forgotten Crossroads, buy the lantern, and go to Crystal Peak. Which you can do before beating the first boss. Mm-hmm. You shouldn't, but you can. Yeah. You could do this. Oh my god goodness. Then you're going to run into some places in the forgot in the Crystal Peaks that technically you don't need things to get through but you really need those things to get through (laughs) uh so so for me what randomizer lets this game do is present me with so many interesting skip options because the game is well designed to present you with the tools you need to progress in a very linear pattern and when randomizer just throws that all against the wall it's like oh what would happen if I had dash and double jump and crystal heart, but not mantis claw and no wall climb? That makes the game very, very difficult because then you're expected to go places that you really want to have mantis claw to get to. Uh, yeah, once you get mantis claw, the game really opens up and you can go in all sorts of different directions. That's a, that's really funny because mantis claw is the last thing I got. I think. And I was like, where the hell do I go? I don't even know where to go anymore. I now, I understand because there are so many places you could go with Mantis Claw. No, I see in this, in my case, it's the the opposite. The one you're supposed to see is on your way down to get Mantis Claw, Hornet runs off into the city. Yep. And once you get Mantis Claw, you can follow her. Oh, wait, maybe, maybe I'm thinking. Mantis Claw is the Mega Man X like wall climb. Oh, okay. No, I just finished the Mantis Lords fight. You would need Mantis Claw to get to the Mantis Lords fight. Okay, so I already have that. No, I did. <laughs> I fought the Mantis Lords, and I was like, these guys are hard, but I beat them. And then I'm like, well, that's the only so part of the map that I didn't have uncovered that I could find. 
I will be honest, there once you beat the Mantis Lords, the game will let you go left, and you should not do that. <laughs> because going into Deep Nest that early is it's horrifying. I don't even know where that is. So It's directly to the left of the Mantis Lords fight. It's and the so door it sort of hints that, you know, you can go here now, but... Then it presents you with a very, very good pictogram of why you should not go there. Like, a giant mountain of dead bugs full of spears. Okay, so, next game on the list is one that I am shocked that I picked. <laughs> because it's a mobile game. Surprise! Dragalia Lost! The this... mobile game that I apparently now care about the most? This might be the game that I have put the most hours into this year. It's just because really it's so game. convenient to do so. I pretty much play it every night before I go to bed. Like, it does a bunch of things that a lot of other games do, but I feel like it's the best combination of those things. Yeah, it's super well executed. And it's just <laughs> charming. Psy Games and Nintendo decided that they wanted a mobile property. So here we are. Psy Games is trying really hard to run out of money and failing at it. I mean, going into mobile ventures with Nintendo is a pretty good way to run out of money traditionally. I mean, so I've played the other game that's almost exactly like this. Grand Blue Fantasy? Grand Blue Fantasy, yeah. And this is a better version of Grand Blue Fantasy, which will probably <laughs> piss off a bunch of Grand Blue Fantasy fans. But like, no, this is a better distilled version of Grand Blue Fantasy. It's so disturbingly similar to the same formula, whereas like instead of a, a sprite that looks like the character from... You know, Secret of Mana, you have a little tiny dragon that follows you around. But, like, all the characters are very similar to your starting cast in Dragali Lost. But, I don't know, it just works better. Um, so, I I am curious, what is the right way you play this game? I mean, I don't know. I'm not sure like, what you mean by that question. I guess I have been I have been playing my way through just the each chapter as it unlocks, like... How long do those chapters go? Like, I hear about raids and group activities. I'm like, oh, that sounds awesome. I'd love to get to that point. Well, those are seasonal. Like, those are basically the events that happen every week or so. And for the most part, like, you can do that pretty early on. I think like, you have how... to get through chapter two? Two dash two. Okay. I'm past... multiplayer. I am past two dash two, so I should... I should have somebody sit down and explain how basically all of the things work in this game. Because I feel like this game, uh, I did not pay enough attention to the tutorials, and now I am super lost. The uh, So the game has, a, has two sets of tutorials. One of them is, hey, here's like the basics to get you through, to get you like started on going through the story. And then the other one is, at the end of chapter six... Hey, here's the events menu, and here's what you can do in the events menu. And the events menu is where all of the, for lack of a better term, endgame content it lives. Ah. And that includes everything from, here's the stuff that you grind for money or for, like, gold crystals to level people up. And here's what you, here's all the stuff that you do for, you like, here's the dragon boss fights. Like, the harder versions of dragon boss fights. And stuff like that. So... Pretty much my nightly routine is that I do all of the things that are in the dailies. So, like, I collect the stuff at my castle. I uh, play a, a co-op game. I do some combination of five activities. I, oh God, I'm drawing a blank at all the rest of them. Like, you have to do the, the whatever of power one. You have the to do the Avenue, the Avenue of the power, power, Avenue of Fortune, the quest in multiplayer collect rupees from a facility and do a daily daily item pull. yeah yeah there you go but yeah like so i do that first and then depending on if i'm awake or not <laughs> <laughs> like like this is a game this is a problem that i play this before i go to sleep because i have absolutely dropped my phone and split my lip um because <laughs> i'm sitting there playing it and in bed but then from that point on i'm like oh i guess i'll do some dragon trials or I'll do some imperial whatever the hell they're called. Or whatever the the like weekly the, event yeah. is. Yeah. When when there's a weekly event, I will grind that until I have if it's the character at a hundred percent uh faction or if it's 
whatever I'm collecting otherwise, powering up my facility. I don't think I've ever fully capped a facility yet, because, like, I got the facility to 25 this last event. Um, but yeah, so, like, the you're basically doing the holidays and then doing your dailies, is how I play. Okay. But there's lots of other people that play different ways. Like, um, you have a certain number of, of meters, so... Like, you have stamina, and you that denotes how many things you can do in a night. But there are items that, like, give you back more stamina, and I seem to have a bunch of them. So. Also, whenever you level up, you get a full stamina refill. Yeah. So whenever I yep. want to, you know, have a night that I play more than just my dailies, like, I have items that will allow me to, to do that. Um, there's also other wings, which are like your play with other people currency. And I never run out of that, but I think Grace has run out of that before. I, I run out of those mostly because the like max level um, dragon and imperial onslaught things take at least three of them at a time. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm I am nowhere near max level. I have a single level eighty character. Everyone oh God, else what? is in yeah, like everyone else is in like the thirty to sixty range. My highest level character is 48. Are you not Grand spending team. gold crystals? Oh, I am constantly starved for them. Okay. Well, like, most of my parties are at a minimum 40-something. Um, like, the the water party is all in the 60s, since that was the last event that happened. Yeah, I, I've now gotten to the point where I have several elemental parties that are just capped out until I can promote people. I've been running stuff with secondary characters just so that they get XP. So, okay. I do have one level 60 character. That's my highest level character. Everybody else is 48. But I also have 17 level 48 characters. Or, like, around 48. So, are you, like, like trying to keep them even? I mean, I'm... I When an event happens, I pour everything into making that team's event that the the team related to that event stronger but like also i just i my teams sort of shift around a lot because a lot of my early pulls were bad and so i put a bunch of time and effort into leveling up uh like my my fire wind light and water teams were like hot garbage for most of the game but means that i have like a bunch of like three star not very good characters in the 40s and oh, I, see, like, like, I leveled my three stars up by pouring resources in them to make them four stars. I didn't think that that made them actually better than a natural four or five star character. It doesn't really, but it does let you level them up more and unlock more of their mana circles. Uh, I mean, there are some characters that I just like better that were three stars than my four and five stars. Like, yeah, the, the, the maid samurai is amazing. She's hilarious. The, the the pirate axe lady is amazing. I still don't have her, and I'm sad. And I also remember, like, from back on, like, in the original raid where we were using water teams, the one where you got uh, celery. You know, I I had two healers available to me. I had a four star healer, which is the sailor guy, and then I had the three star healer, which was the one that didn't think that he painted at the side of blood. Ricard is actually like maybe the best water healer. Exactly. Like. I leveled the four star one up for a while and then discovered that, oh, actually, Rickhart has a regen ability. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's who I'm running with. The four star has some other thing that's like garbage. So that's that's also been a thing that I've discovered. Like, oh, I've put a whole bunch of effort into this character, but I have this other character that's just way better. I should put some resources into that. So there there are actually, there there are absolutely cases where a three star once is some Eldwater is fed into them is better than you know some natural four stars yeah it took me a bit to like understand the abilities enough to be able to say like oh these abilities are good and these abilities are not and i should level up these characters for hope i, I wanted to level I, them up because uh, they look cool <laughs> i still think worm prints are largely nonsense i really don't like worm prints i wish there was a better way to organize them and like at a glance see what their abilities are and compare them instead of having to go into each of them and stare at them and then forget mm. what the previous one I was looking at said. I feel like I mostly wish exist. there was a better auto equip. 
I feel like Worm Prince exists specifically so that even a five star pull can be disappointing. Oh. <laughs> Accurate. You mean so that most five star pulls can be disappointing? Yes. Yeah. So you can see those rainbows and still know that no, it's probably going to be garbage. Oh man, that's that's the worst. Is when it's a freaking worm print. At least a dragon feels good because yeah, like you're going to get use out good. of that dragon. But I wish like, I wish worm I could. Prints, no. I wish that there were a dragon leveling event that I could get because I have all of these cool dragons, but they're all like level three because I just don't have dragon materials. I mean, that's what the tree on your castle yeah, is supposed to be for. That yeah. tree is n- insufficient. Also, I mean, yes. Also, a lot of times you'll get dragon fruits when you give them things on the little floating island. Also, you can buy the highest level dragon fruit off of the store three times a day. That too. Yeah. I just, compared to, the, compared to my ability to get character leveling things, it's like, whoa. I mean, until, until they updated it, I thought worm prints were the thing that was hard to level. But now they have the daily that gives you five or five gold water things. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, they're not as bad anymore. the The tree annoys me because like it very quickly takes three days to level up the tree. Yes. And in those three days, I'm really missing having any dragon fruit. I've gotten mine up to like twenty something now, and it's actually giving useful amounts of. But. Yeah, so, Kodra, I basically don't force it. I just play a little bit every night, and things level for me. So, okay, I feel like that's a totally reasonable way to play. Also, this game is surprisingly fun and functional to play with your friends, which we should probably do more of. But it's true. It really it was... shocked me how easy and fun it was to just like set up a room and play with you guys so the only suggestion that i would do for anyone wanting to play this game is to immediately go into the settings and turn off the 180 turn thing yes well because the game is the 90 degree turn the 90 degree quick turn that keeps getting me yeah whatever the 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 thing that makes you basically turn on a dime it makes it which sounds awkward like i was i always always facing the wrong way while using that yeah, you have, there's quick turn, 90 degree turns, and quick turn, 180 degree turns. And I find that they lead to unintended results more often than, than they are helpful. Because so much of my like early frustration with this game was immediately allevi- alleviated by turning those off. Especially since you can basically like double swipe in a direction to dodge anyway. Anyway, excellent game. I should game. probably try doing that. I, I've still, I've been playing this game nonstop since it came out, and I only recently learned how the auto function worked. Whoa, this makes a huge difference. <laughs> yes, it does, doesn't it? It se- it seems like it's going to be a good thing, but no, it's not. When you turn it off, it just becomes way better. What? Turning off auto? No, turning off ninety the degree and one eighty. Oh, I he- I have them both turned off, but like your mileage may vary. Yeah, auto, auto is fantastic for anything like that you're running daily, like the the daily things, the avenues and and that. Like once you've reached the point where you're really not having to think about them anyway, just just set it to auto and, and let yeah, me like, do it for you. I mean, I I can feel the nine thousand power team, so basically like I can auto all the avenues without issue. It even opens chests for you. It's great. It didn't used to do that when the game it doesn't first break barrels though. Yeah, like originally Auto did not open chests. It does not, however, avoid any traps at all. So <laughs> I do not suggest Auto on any map that has like spikes or something like that. Okay, so we're down to the last game. Hey, what game have we talked about the most this year that we haven't talked about yet on the show? This was this was chosen by four separate people. Monster Hunter World. God, I love this game. It's a pretty fun game. I loved it enough to restart when PC came out, the game's which so was a nice thing that I twice. did not think I was going to do. Like, Grace and I had this discussion. I felt like I was way too progressed into the game to ever give up that progress, and I did it anyway. But making said progress was fun, so you did it again. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, like, the, the biggest thing about this game is, like, you are picking up skills that are not necessarily attached to your armor. Because when I picked it up on the pc <laughs> i progressed so much faster than i did on the console because like yeah. i knew how to do these fights 
You understand the fights. Skill. You you build. I can read these skills. bosses now. I understand. I I did not like Monster Hunter before this, and I still don't like the older Monster Hunter hunters. But I get I get it now. And I am totally here for more Monster Hunter made in this uh, style. Well, and honestly, for me, it it greatly improved my enjoyment of past Monster Hunters. So much so that, like, when Generations uh, Ultimate came out, like, I can play that and enjoy it. I mean, there are things that frustrate me because it does a lot of things different, <laughs> but the core combat loop feels the same. But Monster Hunter games up to this point have been really bad about, like, teaching you anything about the game i honestly don't think world is that much better oh man it just for doesn't me, make you do as much busy work before then for me moving from uh for me moving from this level is a collection of tiny zones to this is a single big open level is absolutely game changing yeah. yes like world changing i like this game and i don't like the previous oh no well, i think it is a much better game in almost every respect but i don't still feel like it has a lot of work to do as far as teaching players how to play it at all oh yes no absolutely that's there's yes it's got a lot of work to do. completely agreed there I mean, that's not to say like when i say it does a better job of teaching players what to do it's it's not a big bar because like the previous games did nothing yeah it this makes, game does it makes something. an attempt <laughs> it tries it gets the the, the participation trophy <laughs> I don't know, like, I, I've recently gotten back into the game a lot. I mean, this is this is the one game that I've played every single month of the year. At least some. And sometimes it's just to pop in for an event, and other times it's like, okay, I'm actually going to progress now. But, like, I feel like time spent in the game always does something interesting. Like, even if I'm working on a weapon, or I'm working on a piece of armor... Like, there's an activity I can do that feels good to do it. I should get back into this game. I played so much when it came out, and I had a specific goal in mind. And that goal was, like, driving me forward to constantly, like, pursue it. And then I achieved it, and I was, like, there was there was just, like, I don't know what I'm doing now once that goal did, was achieved. Did you make the Diablos hammer? I I didn't, but I made the uh, I got a perfect set to use the fire and ice. Uh, oh yeah, to to dual blades. It's an explosion and frost set, and I put together a Teostra and uh, not Valhazek. What's the other elder dragon? The Steel Wind. Um, Kashaldor. Kashaldor, yeah put together just the right pieces and it was super optimized i was super excited and then i was like oh i don't i don't have any cool thing i'm pursuing now i should have started doing tempers but i don't know i just i never did but man this game is fun the thing that like really was a game changer for me is when uh Kolf Taroth came out because like prior to Kolf Taroth, i was probably just a longsword player that's all I really played. Because, like, I, I felt like this was a different enough game that I kind of needed to focus in on one thing and figure it out. And that helped, I think. But Kulf Taroth gave me, like, a constant deluge of interesting weapons to try. So I started playing Hammer and Greatsword and uh, Charge Blade and Switch Axe. And I decided, oh, I like several of these quite a bit. So much so that, like, when the PC version came out, I mostly played Hammer. And, and still, like, I, I play Hammer often over other weapons. And, and farming for that uh, that Hammer it was a thing. But, I don't know, the game changes just enough as you go through it to, to remain interesting. And, oh my god, I hate Kim Tempered Kieran. <laughs> I hate it so much. Like, I've done it twice like, now. Well, actually, oh I've god. done it more than twice. But but then that's not me, Ash. I <laughs> I hit things. I don't shoot hit, things. Hit them with a light bowgun. <laughs> no, no, that's wrong. Sometimes the biggest weapon is not the right weapon for the job. No, that's not because true. The other monster I fought carried with is a great sword. Actually, when I the time I killed Tempered Kieran, I was using hammer. Well, the last time I killed Tempered Kieran, I was using hammer. I've killed it with, like, greatsword and longsword. Other than that, 
I'm I'm just saying tempered carrot is not a problem for me and I use insect glaive. Yes, but you used like the weird weapon. <laughs> it's like it's like the most fiddly weapon ever. I don't I don't think so. I do like I, I strongly things. disagree. There's a way more fiddly okay. weapon. Okay. Yes, there is a, <laughs> there is a single weapon that is way more fiddly. No. And, no. and it was the one that it was the one that uh Kodra was playing a lot of. What? I, I want to play songs. I want to play songs and oh. hit people with my my bagpipes. I was playing a fair bit of a hunting horn, but oh no, that is not more fiddly than insect lay. Hunting horn is very straightforward. Okay, what, I was thinking what? charge blade. I really don't think charge blade is that fiddly. <laughs> no. Or either bow gun. <laughs> bow which are way less fiddly bad. than they used to be, but you know. I mean, I feel like I don't know, like charge blade. Charge blade, I'm just not good at. Like. It always seems to be doing the thing I don't want it to be doing at any given time. Like, <laughs> well, yes. Like, I want to store the v- files. Oh no! I just pulled out my giant axe. What the hell am I going to do now? Um, there are certain weapons that, like, I feel bad when I play, like switch axe, because God, that weapon lops people all the time. Whoops! Oh look, I just knocked my team away. Oh well. But then again, charge blade knocks your team down when you do the giant lightning strike. Whatever they shouldn't have been standing in the way. Yeah, yeah. It's like this you, is also you, you telegraphed it pretty hard. <laughs> what about longsword? No, this is also how I feel about dual blades. Like if I hit you, it's because you oh were standing God. on the monster's legs. Don't stand on the monster's legs. God. Yeah. So I don't know. Dual blades like is really good at pushing you away from the target. If if I could make any sort of ask from the next Monster Hunter game, it would be that multiplayer feels more rewarding and satisfying. Really? I I honestly almost exclusively play this game multiplayer and I do so in a crazy method. Yes, which you is just find SOS random roulette. Groups to join. Yeah, I, I do SOS roulette for things. Cause I don't know, like I just feel the I like the feel of multiple people better than trying to solo everything. Like even if my sixty ish hunter rank is carrying the team, I like playing with other people better than playing by myself. Because it got to the point where, like, I'm almost never the one that faints, which was a switch from, like, the early days when I was always the person that fainted. Going back to the old way, as it were, trying to play Generations Ultimate this summer, yeah, did lead me to realize that, no, I, I like the way Monster Hunter World handles multiplayer quite a bit. <laughs> For those who are not aware, the old ones have single-player quests, which are in the village, and multiplayer quests, which are in the hub. The multiplayer quests are always scaled to multiplayer health, no matter how many people are in them. Yeah, that was a rude awakening the first time I tried one of those. Oh, interesting. I didn't even realize that was a thing that existed. Are those, like, specifically, like, Kolv Taroth? No. No, he's like, talking ultimate. Just oh. Not. This is this is the Great Macau that's in the village, and this is the multiplayer Great Macau in the hub. Are the well, rewards different? Not significantly. Okay. Yeah, and the problem is, is, like, in ultimate, you'll, you'll unlock the multiplayer version of things sometimes faster than you'll unlock the single player version. So I thought it was just the natural progression of the game and then promptly got my butt handed to me. I am so looking forward to Iceborne, which is the expansion for Monster Hunter World. I haven't heard about this, but I'm definitely curious now. It is basically a new region that's being added to Monster Hunter World that is ice-based. Also new monsters, probably returning monsters. The trailer strongly hints at Nargakuga, which is a black wyvern thing, which has been in most of the previous games. Isn't it the one that has basically like giant walrus flat fangs? Uh, no. Although it also, I think, just straight up shows that one. Okay. Let's carry off. Rajang isn't a ice monster, is he? Like the monkey one? <laughs> I've heard it's super trolly. It's not any more trolly than Kirin. But essentially, like, we're going to get one more major content update, I think, this year, and then it will go into freeze until the expansion later this year, or n- later 2019. I'm curious as to which of the uh, previously hinted at monsters we're still going to get. I don't know. The rumors were another Elder Dragon that most people haven't seen yet, and then also uh, the Ice version of Kirin. And I suspect that one might get pushed off to the expansion. Yeah. Since we have Teostra and Lunastra... I wonder if it will be an alternate version of one of the dragons we already have. I hate Lunastra so much. Yeah. 
But they've done a really, like, one of the other things that I really dig about this game is they've done a great job of doing collaborations. And the Assassin's Creed one coming up looks interesting. The um, one that they Devil... just snuck into the game, like, yeah. with no warning yesterday? Yeah. Not on PC, obviously. No, on console so far. Yeah. I love this game with a mouse and keyboard. Other people don't. It feels like I have way more control over everything with mouse and keyboard. I need to adjust keybinds for the bow because melee stuff seems pretty good with mouse and keyboard, but bow does not. I have also made that complaint. I tried to start with heavy bow gun and it was so bad. But adjust the keybinds in it. Yeah, I swapped some stuff up. I, I did not go with the route that I think Ash did, which was the keybinds that were posted on, I don't know, Steam, something like that. Uh, I just made minor tweaks, but it's usable now. I can play with bow. I can play with bow at least as good as I could with a console, so which wasn't great. I mean, I was not amazing at any of the bow weapons. I mean, the ranged weapon I am most likely to play right now is gun lance. That's not. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you're technically firing things, sort of range, but lance is better than gun lance. I so... do love how different all of the weapons feel and play and all of the cool styles this game allows you to uh go for there's a lot of cool player fantasy concepts that this game exposes that other games don't well in in more than just that like there are certain weapon like sets like certain elements certain ways of playing that like make it feel different within the same weapon type like, you can tell it's it's built upon decades worth of another, you know, like the other games. It is finely tuned. So, that was our list of games of the year. That was 19 games. We made decent time, I think. Like, it is not within the hour uh, that we normally record, but, like, it is no worse than some of the shows we've recorded in the past. That's true. This, this, is, a, we, we, this is a weird year for games. It was. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of games that made kind of universal games of the year list that weren't on ours, and I think it's mostly that we just didn't play them this year, so they mm -hmm. may be on next year's. Like, if I ever beat God of War, I have a feeling it will end up on a games of the year show, but I have to now do this thing. Um, I also really want to play Into the Breach. It will probably also end up as a favorite of mine. I just haven't bought it yet. <laughs> Yeah, and, and some of the games that I spent the most time with this year didn't make my list. Yeah, I was in that boat. Several of the games that you guys liked, I enjoyed, but would never have called a game of the year. Wow, and I also think it's interesting that this is probably... The, I, I know for certain this is the first year since we've been doing games of the year that a WoW expansion has come out, and either Grace or I has not put that game on our games of the year show list. Yeah, I don't think there notable. were any or no there was an mmo this, this year i mean there were lots of mmos monster hunter world fallout 76 <laughs> oh, sorry, not, not, lost. well i mean and, and honestly MMOs. like not that's anymore. yeah but the thing is is like that's what i'm playing in place of mmos mm -hmm. i am I playing play. destiny 2 and monster hunter world and those are my primary games and then i'm dabbling in things like fallout 76 which are very much multiplayer games but they're not mmorpgs yeah and I'm, I'm having a harder time getting back into the swing of playing Final Fantasy XIV because I've been out of it so long. Like, it seems way slower paced because I'm used to, you know, Destiny and Monster Hunter, which are very much, you know, action -y games. So it's, it's just weird how that's changed. Any final thoughts before we uh, close the show down? Spyro remakes were real good, but don't quite make the list. Please There's look forward to 2019 when we also talk about Hollow Knight. <laughs> I I rescind my previous year's comment that every game should be on the Switch because I no longer believe that. <laughs> what game came out for the Switch that you don't think belongs there? Oh, no, not uh, not that came out for the Switch, but it was a recurring thing that like, oh hey, this would be a cool game. They should launch it on the Switch for like literally everything. And I played pretty much my entire list of favorite games this year would just not be they would just not have been good switch games mm. and i think that that's interesting and telling i think the switch is great and i spent more time with it than anything else this year but no switch games made my 
Less. As the year went on, I'm spending less and less time with consoles, and it's mostly just PC for me. <laughs> I've been very much the opposite. I've been spending less and less time on my PC and more on consoles. Perhaps we'll converge next year. Maybe. <laughs> anyway, hopefully you enjoyed the show, and uh, hopefully we at least had an interesting uh, list. It was quite different than most of the other best games of 2018 lists that I've seen, so... I think that's, that's because we something. don't play games on time. No, we don't. Anyway, uh, hopefully have a good night, and we will see you next week for a normal show. Sounds right. Good yeah. night. Good Happy night. New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. See ya.